So Adam Grant, author and speaker and business school professor and social media influencer and TED Talk multi-million hit wonder, best-selling author, I should say. I just want to say to you, thanks so much for joining us on Intelligence Squared. Great to be here, John. I love the Intelligence Squared debates, and I hope we're going to get to do some debating during this conversation. Yeah, we, we might well get to that. Um, but I, I first want to talk with you about um, the sense in which your contribution to our culture and to society and to business on sort of an ongoing basis involves your taking your background in psychology, uh, starting as an undergraduate, but then going on to everything that you have learned since, what you keep on learning from reading and from talking to people and from social psychology experiments, is all sort of aimed at fixing something. Um, You do that for businesses and other clients, but anybody who writes a book like the one you've come out with called Think Again is definitely trying to fix something or at least point the way to doing something better. And my my first question to you is, what is the thing that you're trying to point us to to do better these days, Adam? <laughs> there are a lot of them. <laughs> which 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 one? I think I think probably at the heart of at least my work around think again is trying to help people become better critical thinkers. I think we live in a world where many people aspire to be lifelong learners, and they get stuck at some point along the way. Um, and their minds end up closing. Uh, they end up sort of in in a series of, of cognitive traps that we could talk about that really stop them from continuing to grow. And I think one of my goals is to use the best evidence available to invite people to uh, to listen to ideas that make them think hard, not just the opinions that make them feel good. What, what do you think is the thing that causes people to stop at a certain point? Well, I think some of it is, you know, it's just plain what psychologists call cognitive entrenchment, which is making assumptions that you don't even realize you're holding, like a fish that doesn't know it's in water. Um, But I think more of it is probably motivational and social. Uh, The motivational part being, I don't want to feel like an idiot. And every time I admit that I'm wrong, I feel a little bit dumber. And I also don't want to look like an idiot or get excluded or ostracized by my tribe that shares my views. And so it's a lot easier to stick to the comfort of conviction rather than embracing the discomfort of doubt. So you're, as you survey the culture now, and let's make this, you know, American culture, United culture in the United States, the culture of discourse, the, the culture of politics, et cetera. Uh, how do you grade where we are in this kind of entrenchment that you're talking about? Or on the flip side, how, do, how well do you think we're doing as critical thinkers as a culture? Does the scale go below F? <laughs> Okay, Not good. there's your answer. Not good. Yeah. I mean, what are some examples of what, what, how, what where, where are you basing this grade on? Well, I think, I think if we think about life domains, one of the, the saddest studies I read recently is actually a series of studies showing that people would rather have a conversation with a stranger who shared their political views than a friend who didn't. That's, I mean, that's a travesty. I, I guess, you know what, actually, let me rethink that. I guess you could say that's, that's good news that people are open to having conversations with strangers, not just their friends, yeah, except yeah. you're throwing you know, a, a social bond, a meaningful connection out the window just because you have a different set of views. Um, that, that seems awfully short-sighted and closed-minded to me. It sounds like the, the, the different point of view is making a stranger of somebody who's a friend. I think, I think that's part of the problem, yes. So what do you, in the, in the book, Think Again, again, as you just said a moment ago, it's a lot of things that you're trying to fix, but what's the overall, what's the overall sort of schematic viewpoint that you're trying to present in the book? Well, I think when I, when I looked at the, the data on, on why people have such a hard time questioning their assumptions, their opinions, their decisions, um, it, one of the, the consistent findings is that too many of us spend too much of our time thinking like preachers, prosecutors, and politicians. And John, I know you would never do this, but other people <laughs> occasionally, right? In preacher mode, they're busy trying to proselytize their own views. In prosecutor mode, they're attacking somebody else's views. And in politician mode, they only listen to people who already share their views. And my concern with all three of these mental models, right, they're mindsets that we can slip in and out of at any point in our day, is that whether you, you know, you're, whether your biggest vice is, you know, getting locked into preaching, prosecuting, or politicking, 
in all of those modes, you've concluded that you're right and other people are wrong. So they might need to think again, but your mental work is already done. And what I wanted to do in Think Again was to teach people to escape those traps by thinking a little bit more like a scientist. John, when I say think like a scientist, I do not mean that you need to own a microscope or buy a telescope. Let's be clear. Although, personally, I would enjoy it if you dressed up like Bill Nye on a weekly basis. (laughs) For me, though, thinking like a scientist means that you don't let your ideas become your identity. That you're as motivated to look for reasons why you might be wrong as you are to search for reasons why you must be right. That you see your opinions as hypotheses waiting to be tested. Uh, You see your decisions as experiments, right, that, that might falsify your hypotheses. And you have the humility to know what you don't know and the curiosity to find out more. And so much of that means, you know, I'm, I'm not going to define myself by my opinions. I'm going to define myself by my principles. And one of those core principles is that I'm somebody who's passionate about learning. And so changing my mind is actually a sign of integrity. Uh, when I think like a scientist, uh, admitting that I was wrong means that I'm actually living by that value of pursuing the truth. I hear you saying that for the individual, it can be threatening to their sense of identity to admit they were wrong. But there's also, so that's an internal pressure, but there's also an external pressure on people who who admit they're wrong in public. I'm thinking particularly of political leaders. If they change their position, they're immediately accused of flip-flopping as though that is a lack of integrity, as though they are just putting their finger in the wind. And and maybe in some cases they are, but certainly not in all cases. Um, But talk a little bit about that external factor, if if whether or not that's part of the critique you're doing. Yeah, I think... (laughs) I think that it's it's really easy for politicians to get accused of flip-flopping whenever they change the, their stance. And I think what we need to recognize is it's not how frequently somebody changes their mind that matters. It's when and why. If you just change your policy to appease an audience and get their approval, that is literally thinking like a politician. You're a flip-flopper. If you rethink your views based on new facts, you've learned something. And I think that we, we need a culture change on this. We need to recognize that integrity is not about maintaining fidelity to your beliefs. It's about maintaining fidelity to seeking the truth and to solving problems. And there are, there are many different ways to do that. Uh, I don't know that any of them are going to be easy. But f- from my perspective, if, you know, if I have to choose a political candidate, I would, I would say it's, I would prefer the candidate who's willing to contradict herself at the risk of being accused of hypocrisy, over the one who sticks to her guns and sacrifices her integrity, right? The, the hallmark of real integrity is being honest, not being consistent. We, we got very excited when your book came out here at Intelligence Squared because it, a book that has the title Think Again, um, that's music to, to our ears at Intelligence Squared because as, as I think our audience knows, we put on a debate between opposing points of view, we we do force a polarity that perhaps sometimes is artificial, but we also make the point that this is like just for the time being, we're forcing this polarity. But what we're really trying to do is to hear people who, who disagree about something, uh, try to be persuasive to a third party and perhaps to each other, uh, that they should change their minds, that they should indeed think again. So, we we I started reading your book with the notion that, oh, this is going to overlap with a lot of what we do in Intelligence Squared. And then, boom, I hit Chapter 5. And in Chapter 5, you actually cover an actual Intelligence Squared debate that we put on back in 2015, uh, 2018 in February. And it was an historic debate for us because we did something very, very unusual. We had a debate between a human being and... Uh, an artificial intelligence machine, uh, computer, put together by IBM that IBM referred to as IBM Debater. So it was the first of its kind between artificial intelligence and a human being. Um, You write about it in great detail. I I just want to give our audience a sample of what the, 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 the artificial intelligence sounded like. They, they gave it a voice. They gave it uh, a female voice, in fact. They didn't give it a name other than uh, Project Debater. There was a resolution put before the audience that government should uh, subsidize preschool. And each of the contestants was given the, the topic only 15 minutes before the debate, and then they had to actually 
go at it. And here was the opening from the conclusion to the opening from IBM Debater. I hope I relayed the message that we should subsidize preschools. You will possibly hear my opponent talk today about different priorities and subsidies. He might say that subsidies are needed, but not for preschools. I would like to ask you, Mr. Natarajan, if you agree in principle, why don't we examine the evidence and the data and decide accordingly? Thank you for listening. So, so that was interesting to me. I was the moderator of that debate, uh, and, and there was that pause after Project Debater stopped talking. Everybody was aware that they were listening to an artificial intelligence speaking, and when it stops, it, the, the moment of applause didn't really feel quite natural, so, so I prompted it. But um, I wanted to just get a, a line or two from you about why that debate was interesting to you, and then I have a little surprise for you and our audience. Uh, well, John, it was, I mean, it was fascinating. I, first of all, let me, let me just say what I've always loved about Intelligence Squared is that you have done for debate what TED Talks have done for speeches. Uh, you've elevated it into an art form, and you've shown us what, what it looks like for, for two people who don't necessarily share the same information or the same views, uh, what, what it looks like for them to argue thoughtfully and constructively. And uh, I think, you know, so many of your debates that I've watched, I've, I've found myself changing my mind many times during them, which is, to me, the hallmark of, of a really great debate. What I loved about this one was, I, I actually, I remember deciding I was going to write a chapter about how debate could open minds. And I said, okay, I'm going to look up a world debate champion and see what I can learn from their techniques. And uh, Harish Natarajan came up right away. And one of the first hits was this, this debate with Project Debater. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if, unlike in chess, the human outsmarted the, compu- the computer? And I watched the debate, and sure enough, Harish won. And I couldn't believe it because Project Debater was better on every single objective metric of argument quality, um, data sophistication, and should have won, and yet didn't. And that was, for me, a puzzle waiting to be solved. I'm John Donvan. This is Intelligence Squared U.S. We'll hear more from our debaters right after this. Welcome back to Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm your host, John Donvan. Let's get back to our conversation. All right, I want to talk about what that how you solve that puzzle. But first, I want to bring in as the surprise, our CEO, Clea Connor. Uh, and Clea, uh, we, we, we get, give so little credit to the people behind the scenes uh, at Intelligence Square because they make it all seem so seamless. But uh, Clea just deserves so much credit for uh, a bunch of things at Intelligence Square, including where we are in our pivot during the pandemic to keep going and get stronger and bigger. But back then, she's the one who brought that computer to our stage. And Clea, welcome into the program. Don't be shy. Hi, you know, <laughs> thank you for such a generous uh, introduction, John. And hi, Adam. It's so great to have you on the show. Well, that remains to be seen. We're not done yet. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's- so, Adam, do you know the backstory to how this debate came to be? No, I don't actually. I would love to hear it. Go for it, Clea. Sure, sure. You know, in in your book, Adam, you talk a little bit about it. It began in around 2011. You know, every decade, IBM has a grand challenge. They want to advance, you know, machine learning and the science of computing with a grand challenge. So you may recall chess, um, there was Jeopardy. And, you know, in the, in the, you know, 2010 decade, they said, we're done playing games. We want to build something that has, you know, a real impact on challenging people, but also elevating, you know, what computers can do. And something that had both the element of gamification that a computer could learn, but would also engage with a human being was debate. You know, there's, a, there's an argument and a counter argument, and that's something that can actually be programmed. So um, that's how they began. And they approached us in like 2013, 14, um, under an NDA to say, hey, can we start ingesting transcripts from all of the Intelligence Squared debates? Um, can I, can with- I just break in to, re- to remind people what an NDA is? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, Non-disclosure agreement, (laughs) which is, you know, no longer the case. This is now in the public, the public sphere. So, Um, but essentially we provided a lot of tools, resources, insights over a period of about, you know, five years to help train Project Debater. 
And in fact, Project Debater's voice was very much trained from hearing Intelligence Squared debates, um, how an argument was made, how a counter argument was framed. Um, you know, when somebody really disagreed, even the tenor and timber of the voice. So, so it's pretty cool. And it was amazing to be behind the scenes watching uh, the technology evolve. Um, you know, in the first debate we saw, we were like, is this going to work? Um, this, this thing didn't really pull out the right facts and figures and respond in time and all kinds of things. And it was extraordinary to see how quickly the computer did learn and began to, to debate uh, we were at all the previews, and then we we hosted the very first debate, you know, between Project Debater and and um, what we call our human debater. <laughs> 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 and that's a little bit of a background about it. Um, you know, one of the things, Adam, you just said it, that was so interesting was, you know, looking him up and, and thinking, I, you know, how skeptical it was. How could a human beat a computer that has access to a corpus of data of 400, you know, like billion sources? And um, I had the same skepticism. And I remember posing the question to the IBM scientists and they said, actually, the computer has a huge disadvantage uh, because it can't read the room. And this was the big advantage that the human being had to be able to see how arguments were landing, even see facial expressions, body language and respond to that. And I thought that was such a fascinating takeaway in terms of the art of persuasion. So you know, that's a, just a little bit of background there. We're, we're really proud to have been involved in it. And, um, and you know, I loved your, your assessment of, you know, creating an anagram out of Project Debater. Curious why you did that. Was it to make sure humans, you know, didn't, didn't judge it unfairly for being a machine? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I, I knew the second I watched this that one of the advantages of, of doing it in writing or, frankly, in audio <laughs> was that I could disguise the identity of, you know, of the prodigy, right? This is, Project Evader was very much a prodigy. Uh, yeah. I just neglected to mention that she wasn't a human prodigy. And <laughs> I, thought, I thought it would be more interesting to tell the story with, you know, with the audience, with, the re with readers thinking through, okay, you know, there's this international debate champion. He's in his early 30s. Uh, he's probably the most successful debater alive right now. And there's this eight-year-old upstart, uh, and she's you <laughs> from know, she's, Israel. Yeah. yeah, from Israel. She's a wonderkind, uh, and she's you know she's ready. She's been practicing, uh, and let's you know that, that I think it raises the stakes a little bit in some ways. Uh, that you know is 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 the guy going to be toppled by this upstart wonderkind kid? Uh, I think I was also worried that if I if I led with the machine. The audience would, the readers at least, would immediately say, "Well, you know, they they picked the audience picked Harish because they wanted to vote for the human over the the computer," and so I wanted a fair a fairer comparison where you could read the arguments of both and then see who you found more persuasive. And I, I found that when I wrote it that way, I I understood why I I found Harish more persuasive, and it wasn't the computer versus human distinction that mattered most to me. Yeah, that's what you're you're gonna get to, and and Claire, I'd like you to just stay if you don't mind a few more minutes because there's another point I want to circle back to. But you were you were you started this, uh, Adam, by saying, "All right, you looked at it and and you thought that the artificial intelligence intelligence had everything going for it, stronger arguments in a lot of ways, and yet lost." You feel legitimately putting aside maybe people were favorable towards the humans because they're also humans, but you said that there was a a strength that. Harish had that project debater did not have. Yeah, I think it was it was very interesting. What I what I did first was I started transcribing the debate and you know trying to to walk through what were the points where I started to find Harish more persuasive. And when when I looked at that and put it side by side with the evidence on what a great negotiator or a great debater does, I was struck that Project Debater was debating, was making a bunch of arguments and basically preaching the virtues of some evidence and prosecuting, you know, the alternative view on, on preschool subsidies. Harish was, was, he was dancing. He was sidestepping. He was letting his partner lead. And I actually didn't have this vocabulary when I wrote the book. I, I wish I had. I think it would have been a, a more elegant way to describe what he did well. What Harish does, the, the Project Debater did not learn to do is... Um, he shows his receptiveness. He is putting information out there, signaling he's open to changing his mind. He's not over-justifying his arguments with, you know, with 14 facts. 
Um, and he's acknowledging that the audience may find even some aspects of his argument unconvincing. And what that signals to you is he is rethinking. He's someone who's open to learning, and that makes him more trustworthy than the computer that's already determined its opinion. It's a little bit ad hominem in a way. In other words, you're saying that the audience needed a reason to believe in and trust the debater, and that Harish was superior at that. I think so. I think he, you know, it was interesting. He he did something that we see great negotiators do consistently, which is he actually started out by agreeing with his opponent, which is the exact opposite of what you're supposed to do in a, in a formal debate, right? Uh, but Harish just comes in and says, you know, actually, let me acknowledge a couple of good points that Project Debater made. And that allows you to see that he's a reasonable person. He can literally be reasoned with. Um, and I think that, you know, that, that takes, it, it, it prevents you from having to choose sides. You can say, well, I can agree with some of what, what Project Debater is saying and agree with some of what Harish is saying. And Harish allows me to get best, the best of both worlds. Whereas if I, if I agree with Project Debater, she's right and he's wrong. Claire, we, we went on with, with IBM and uh, Debater, not exactly Debater, but um, our partnership with IBM for some future, further debates. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a, a good question is here, why, why is this Project Debater important, you know, to this moment in time? And one of the things that IBM, um, you know, kind of expressed later in applying it to various places in the business, including Watson um, and other like research and analysis projects, is that right now we're in a moment where you hear so often misinformation, disinformation, and, you know, kind of distortion of facts. And the debater is pretty, you know, it's it doesn't have conviction for one side or the other. It can argue both sides. And so we thought that was a really neat you know, place to start with a program that we did um, actually with Bloomberg TV during the presidential election. The last election, we did a series of debates and actually utilized the technology in the program, um, which was the first time we also used, you know, AI in, in television to scale, uh, you know, public opinion and debate. And basically, debater ingested all the arguments. There were thousands of arguments that came in from the general public and then summarized them and said, this is what's most important to people, what they're most concerned about. Let's have a debate about these issues. And that was a really cool way of actually kind of using this to, to facilitate a conversation with a lot of people. <laughs> That's fascinating. Yeah. Adam, there, we're, we, we haven't had a live debate now of, uh, on stage in front of uh, human beings who can see us and we can see them from the stage since um, February of 2020. But before that, my favorite part of every debate, and I, I've, done, I've done about 200 of them now, my favorite part was always the same. After the debate was over, I would step out into the lobby and kind of float on the ocean of excitement that I felt happening there as people poured into the lobby and crowded shoulder to shoulder. And I would chat with people, and there was a really, really high level of buzz. And people would be continuing to have the talking about the debate and sharing their views and swapping ideas back and forth. But as I chatted with people, the ones who I found most kind of um, ebullient and just and on, on a high about what they had just been through were those who had changed their minds. I People would say to me, you know, I came in here and I never thought that I could change my mind on, on such and such a topic, but I did tonight. And they would kind of share a sense of excitement and exhilaration that they had gone through this process in the course of about maybe an hour and a half or something like that. But I, I, it was so remarkable to me that this thing that, as you said earlier, we anticipate is going to be painful, so painful that we dig in on our views, we become entrenched, to watch people who decided to indulge in this exercise of coming to a debate, taking our challenge to them to listen critically and to keep open minds, and then actually did change their minds, were thrilled by having gone through it. That's amazing to hear. And I think it, it speaks to the power of a few things that, to me, are built into your, your structure that are missing from everyday life. The first one is that people come to listen. Uh, they, they show up to really digest information in a deep way um, and to, to focus their full attention on a debate. 
The second is that they don't have to advocate for a position, right? So one, mm. one of the most fundamental findings in psychology over the last half century is when you argue for a position, you are not convincing the other person as much as you are convincing yourself. And the idea that I can come as a fly on the wall and hear other people grapple with different views and, and nuanced issues, um, it's very different from me being one of the debaters. Uh, and I think that's, that's ingenious to, to make sure that there are many more people in the audience than there are on stage. <laughs> um, and then the, the last thing for me is that you've really set up these debates to, to make it clear to people that this is a learning experience, right? I, I think you're, you're actually setting the stage for the joy of being wrong, that people get that rush of saying, wow, I learned something new. And I think that the challenge is to, to take that experience and pour it into our, our everyday interactions. Yeah, I think that says something to the fact that a, a lot of people who, again, when we were doing these in New York, you, I, I would get the feeling that, that there were people who were dragged to the debate uh, by, <laughs> by a fan. And then they became fans after that. They, I would see those people again and again and again because they're, it's interesting you say the joy of being wrong. I don't think most people would think of that as being a, a potentially joyful experience, but I've seen it. I've actually seen it. I mean, there, there's another, another theme that you talk about a great deal about the willingness to acknowledge that you are wrong. And that is the concept and the value of humility, um, which really spoke to me because I had I had a very very long career as a journalist for ABC News, um, and uh, started when I was very very young, and went to more than thirty five years of working for them, in a lot of uh, situations where there was strong strong contentiousness involved. I, I was the White House correspondent. I was the Jerusalem correspondent. I covered Israel. I covered Russia during its collapse, Eastern Europe's collapse. Uh, uh, wars in various places. And these are all highly, highly contentious situations in which one side says they're right and the other side says they're right. And they fight against each other and they struggle with each other. And I found myself, particularly as a, particularly as a foreign correspondent in cultures that I didn't understand, throwing away the value that we were taught in my generation was the most important value as a journalist, which was objectivity, which was the notion that there's a solid truth out there. You need to go find it. You go, need to go report it. You need to keep your personal views out of it. Those became somewhat ingrained habits in me, keeping my personal views out of what I put into the program. But at core, I didn't believe in the value of, of objectivity. And I never said it out loud because it was so much the shibboleth of the time, objectivity, objectivity. I've developed a different set of values for what drove me as a journalist in trying to get at some semblance of a, of a truth, which again, I would question is really something that can be nailed down. I pursued three things. One was honesty. The second was curiosity. And the third was humility. The idea that I probably really didn't know. I probably really wasn't equipped to opine on any of this stuff. And, and I found throughout my career when people love to go to journalists and say, what's going to happen and who's right? And I, I have always avoided those conversations, which makes me kind of <laughs> the perfect candidate to be an Intelligence Squared moderator because I'm standing in the middle and I'm trying to inv involve the two sides and not involve myself. And then I found that your argument in Think Again depends so much on the notion of humility. And I want to know what you mean by humility in this, in this idea of being able to think again and change your mind. Well, let me start by saying, John, that if we could elevate those principles of honesty, curiosity, and humility, I actually think that might be a better path to objectivity than attempting to direct objectivity itself. I, mm -hmm. I don't think it's possible for anyone to be objective, right? As, as sure. a psychologist, I know that everyone has biases, and if you don't think you have them, then you're falling victim to the I'm not biased bias where you think that you, you're capable of a level of neutrality that you know no other human being is. So what would make you any different? And that makes you ironically more biased in the data. So I think, you know, I, I actually think that the best way to be objective is, is to prize the principles that you just described. And when, when we talk about humility... I, I think about intellectual humility as, as just being willing to both acknowledge um, and explore what you don't know. Um, that means 
There is an ever-expanding list of things that you're uncertain about, that you're uninformed about, and you're excited to to try to fill some of those gaps in your knowledge, knowing that you're you're probably not going to find the truth uh, with a capital T, but you can get closer to it. And the best way to get closer to it is to be less wrong. Um, I think that we don't we don't teach this kind of humility in part because. Humility gets a bad rap. A lot of people think about it as low self-esteem or lacking confidence. I love that one of the Latin roots of humility translates to from the earth. And what that signals to me is that humility is about being grounded. It's about recognizing that you're human, you're fallible, you have strengths, you also have weaknesses. And that means you can actually display confident humility, which is being secure enough in your own knowledge to admit what you don't know. The handful of leaders that I've really admired are the ones who started COVID by saying, we actually don't know how to, how to fight this yet, but I'm confident that we have an excellent team that's going to figure it out. And as, as the science changes, our policies are going to change with it. That is confident humility. I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I believe I'm capable of leading us toward a better future. I'm John Donvan. This is Intelligence Squared U.S. We'll hear more from our debaters right after this. Welcome back to Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm your host, John Donvan. Let's return to our discussion. This is a great example. The, the whole COVID experience, the science, the, uh, the lapses of science, the uh, turning away of science. Let's talk a little bit more about that. How, how do you grade, again, the culture? And I, I realize the culture is a very, very broad term. So I guess I'm asking sort of on average, do you think that we are, uh, did well, did well in part, did poorly in terms of being able to think critically about the challenge that was ahead of us, what we had to do about it? how to stay on f- target, to stay on focused in doing what we needed to do about it? It's been an ocean of failure with uh, some occasional rivers of A pluses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, th- I think it's, you know, it's, it's frustrating to me, actually, that w- the technical science is where we excelled, and communication and human behavior is, I think, where our handling of this pandemic has completely fallen apart, right? I, every single epidemiologist I spoke to, every pharma company I've been in touch with uh, was convinced that if we could accomplish a miracle of having vaccines available and develop, well, I should say, sorry, I'll just back up. <laughs> I, I think all of the experts that I spoke with believed that the fundamental problem was could we develop a vaccine fast enough and make it available widely enough to protect the world population. And as far as scientists are concerned, it was a miracle, right, that we were able to do this this quickly. It's one of the greatest accomplishments in human history. And yet here we are with the pandemic still raging two years later because we have been unable to communicate about COVID, about masking, about vaccination, about the evolving data in such a way that, that builds trust and confidence Uh, as opposed to divisiveness. And I think that is an epic failure on the part of many governments, scientists, public health experts, and uh, and folks like me too, social scientists, who have been studying better ways to do this, but have not disseminated our work effectively enough. What's what's your analysis of what went wrong? (laughs) It's a a little bit like being in the middle of a forest fire and trying to find the match that started it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there there are a whole series of conditions that, that made this job more difficult, but I think one of the first mistakes uh, was that we we didn't do anything around science literacy. Um, I think, you know, blanket statements were made at various points, like, you don't need to wear a mask, and all of a sudden, now you do. Wait a minute. Like, both of those are high-certainty messages coming from a questionable trustworthiness source. They're inconsistent. Like, are you going to change tomorrow? What, what's going on here? Am I being, mm-hmm. you know, just subjected to flip-flopping? Or is this a manipulator? Um, I, I don't know what to trust. Um, you know, I think similar problems, I, I think there's just been a tremendous lack of, I guess what we need is, um, 
what Oliver Wendell Holmes would have described as uh, as the other side of of complexity, right? The the simplicity on the other side of of complexity, which I would think about as as elegant simplicity instead of ignorant simplicity, where instead of making blanket statements like vaccines are safe and effective, where I immediately want to ask, well, how safe and effective for whom? <laughs> From the beginning, it should have been clear that. Uh, vaccines are generally more effective in preventing severity of symptoms from escalating than they are in preventing the incidence of symptoms from existing, right? In other words, we're, we're better at preventing mortality than we are at preventing uh, anyone from getting COVID to begin with. I think a direct comparison of the risks of getting COVID, both in probability and severity, versus the risks of vaccines would have been much more honest and accurate to just say, you know what? yes. Vaccines are not perfectly safe or perfectly effective. You mm -hmm. know what else is not perfectly safe or perfectly effective? Uh, wandering around and hoping you don't get a deadly case of COVID. And so, but let's let's compare. But the, but those th you know those, those things are those things are being said out there, and maybe they were not said at the beginning, not early enough, and not loudly enough. And, and nor an explanation that the situation was nuanced, that it's not going to be yes or no, black or white, that it wasn't binary, but. You know, I hear you now, I feel, taking the position that, by and large, um, vaccines have done a good thing and I'm, ha have been a good thing for, uh, for addressing the situation. Um, yet I hear people who, who bring reason, their own reasons, but reason to the other side of the argument, who, who speak rationally and calmly. Um, most of them are being shut out of uh, uh, responsible social media positions at this point. But I'm wondering, where where are you in your need, where you feel you have a need to hear and be persuaded by people who would be making an argument like that? Is there a point at which you're done listening to contra uh, contrarian views about something like this? In other words, do you stop the think again process at a certain point? And not just in the case of COVID, but in... All, all the situations in which one may, would want to be applying critical thinking. Is there a point where you stop really listening to another point of view or you have exhausted yourself with listening to that other point of view and it's nothing new and you've made up your mind? That's a, that's a really good question, John. I think another way of framing the question is, is there such a thing as settled science? Yeah, I'll buy that. I think that is another way. Of, go for it. I think it, I think it really depends on the domain. Uh, in, in the case of COVID, I think it would be scientifically and morally irresponsible to shut out new information because there is so much to learn. Um, am I willing to ignore all arguments that the earth is not round? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. At this point, I think we have, we have enough evidence accumulated from, uh, from the most rigorous tools available to, to rule out the, the Frisbee theory, right? So I think... I think with, with COVID, though, there's, there's a distinction I would make, and, and this is probably one I would make more broadly, too, which is I don't actually get a lot of, out of listening to contrarian viewpoints on this because they tend to be heavy on opinion and light on data. Mm -hmm. um, what I was trained to do as a social scientist was to look at randomized controlled experiments, careful longitudinal studies with, uh, with systematic attention to control variables, and ideally, a meta-analysis of, you know, of those sources where you do a study of studies, adjusting for rigor and sample size um, and try to accumulate what the effects are. And, you know, so let's, let's take masking as an example of this. Uh, if, if, I, if I had taken the settled science view, uh, over the summer I would have said, okay, we, we know masks work. <laughs> we, we can stop at this point. But there was a group of scientists who, who ran that incredible trial in Bangladesh with over 340,000 people randomly assigning entire villages to different types of masks. And lo and behold, showed that surgical masks were consistently effective, cloth, ma cloth masks, not so much. I don't really care what any expert had to say about that, right? Expert opinion is the weakest form of evidence. The strongest form of evidence is a very carefully done study. And so I, I think this whole debate about you know, should we be hearing contrarian voices? Um, I'm, I'm not really interested in the voices. I'm interested in the, the most carefully collected data. So I hear your answer in terms of COVID. Can we generalize to more broadly, when is the point when you're having a disagreement with um, 
an individual about some of the contentious issues of today, for example, whether there's cancel culture, the, the meaning of privilege, um, uh, systemic racism, a lot of things that are, that are very controversial where there are two clear points of view that are not seeing each other. Where's the point where you are not just, as you would say, trying to prosecute your point of view, yeah. but you stop and say, you know, I, I want to listen to you. I want to hear you. I am open to being persuaded by you. I go for it. Where, where do you where do you draw the line? Because there's not just a matter of identity as you've talked about, but also a matter of of rock solid principle and values that are so meaningful to you that a contrary point of view would would not only be earth shaking but would be offensive. It would seem almost immoral. And because those are the kinds of conversations we're having, you're arguing, you're making the case we should be we should be willing to have our minds changed. But is that always the case when there's a when there are topics like those before us? Well, I think we should be slower to change our principles than we are to change our policies, right? Mm-hmm. I think that probably your values are the the last thing to rethink, and you should be much more eager to to rethink uh, the the daily assumptions and opinions that you form uh, than you know those those bedrock principles that that you deem as like central to to how you live your life. But I I think we should commit to being open on everything and you know let's let's take the kinds of divisive conversations that are going on in America right now um, I think you know there are a lot of debates about security versus freedom for example or maybe it's safety versus freedom well guess what I value both of those things John I bet you do too and the question is at what point are we willing to trade freedom for safety uh, and that's a debate that I would love to have uh, it's a debate I've had with many times, and I usually, when I remember anyway, um, I've, I've had that debate with people who have very different views than I do, and that's true by definition because I'm not sure I have a view on that. I don't have good data on it, so I'm, right. I'm pretty open. Um, my ideal starting point for that debate is to say, listen, John, I have a bad habit of of being the world's most annoying prosecuting attorney. If I think you are wrong, I am going to go into logic bully mode and... <laughs> <laughs> I've learned in the past that that what that motivates you to do is is bring your best defense attorney to the courtroom, and then neither yeah. of us budges. And I don't no. want to be that guy anymore. So if you catch me doing that, please let me know. I love that term when you put, brought it up in the book. You said t- you said that a student of yours uh, brought up that term. I, uh, just talk a little bit more about what she meant that you were a logic bully. <laughs> yeah, I'll never I'll never forget when when Jamie stopped me in the middle of she had come for some career advice actually, and uh, I. I felt like she was being pretty one-sided, and my job as as a, a mentor was to challenge her thinking. And I, I pushed back, and she I remember her saying, you're a logic bully. And I said, a, a logic what? And she said, a logic bully. You just overwhelm me with facts and rational arguments, and I don't agree, but I don't feel like I can argue back. And I, I realized that I have been losing arguments that way for my whole life and thought, thinking I was winning. Well, losing in what sense? Lose it, losing, losing the, failing to persuade or being wrong? I, it, m- much more failing to persuade. So I've, uh-huh. you know, I've made what I think is either the correct argument or the argument that, <laughs> that balances out her extreme view. And yet the other person is not only not persuaded, but chooses to disengage because they don't feel like they have an ownership position in the conversation and they don't feel like their views are being treated with respect. And so I, um, I now I've, I just, you know what, <laughs> if you're going to, if you're going to have a debate with me, you will probably meet my inner logic bully at some point, John. And I might as well let you know that that could happen so that you could give me the feedback because I don't even know what's happening and you're going to see it before I do. And that, that will make it much easier for me to course correct. But I've also found that calling that out up front motivates the other person to make a commitment to being open to that when I say, hey, (laughs) I have a bad habit of being a logic bully, the other person will often say, you know, I can be, I can be the most stubborn person on earth and I don't want to be like that either. And guess what? We have both made a verbal promise that we're going to argue to learn instead of just arguing to win. Another, another issue that's out there where two sides will cite data on something that's very, very sensitive topic would be on whether policing is racist. And it's actually a debate that we held in Intelligence Squared. And it's, it's another one where I, I'm asking you, should each side actually listen to the other on the basic 
premise, debating whether the basic premise is true, that there's a, a big problem, a, a, a large-scale endemic problem with racism in policing. When, when one side will absolutely say yes, and the other side will say, well, no, not really, and here's why. Should those two sides be engaging in the way you're talking about over a topic like that, being willing to listen to each other, and most importantly, being willing to change their minds? I would hope so. But I also, I want to make sure that the debate is done with, so many of these debates, this is a good example, can be informed by good data if if you set them up in a way where we define our, our terms clearly. So right, right. if we're going to have this debate about policing and whether police racism is a serious problem in America, we need to agree on a definition of racism. Are we talking about psychological racism or structural racism? Uh, we need to agree on how it manifests. Are we talking about who gets stopped? Are we talking about who gets shot? Are we talking about severity of, um, you know, of punishment recommendations? And once we've defined those terms, it's a lot easier to to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I would always, I would, I would also say, it's frustrating to me that this conversation is is framed that narrowly. I would start mm -hmm. by asking: Do human beings have biases? And do the systems and institutions that human beings create have biases? Of course, we're mm -hmm. all flawed. Okay, now, <laughs> let's think about how those biases work, and let's look at the data on which ones play out in the context of race. Um, and I think that, that that structure for the debate makes it a lot easier for people to, to look at relevant evidence because so many of these mm -hmm. conversations that I've seen and been part of are people talking past each other where right. one person is claiming that, you know, that police officer is, you know, doesn't harbor hate toward a black person. And somebody else is saying, like, this police force is, you know, doing a, an unfair amount of stop and frisking and they're not even discussing the same data. They're not talking about the same thing. Yeah, I hear you. I, I think that's a really good po point that the framing is critical and definitions are critical. You know, as we wrap up, I just want to look at, again, what we try to do with debate is to get people to debate in good faith. And yet we're in a world now where misinformation is so normalized and we're in a world where so much of our discourse takes place on social media. How do those two things go together, the spread of misinformation, the normalization, and its, its, its propagation multiplied by trillions of times through social media? How do you have a, a good, honest debate these days? Well, I, th I think you start by opening your own mind. I, one of the things I noticed a couple of years ago on social media was I was mostly following people because I agreed with their conclusions. And it, it hit me that <laughs> you don't learn by affirming your beliefs. You learn by evolving your beliefs. And I decided I was going to make a concerted effort to identify people where I didn't always agree with their conclusions, but I respected the integrity of their thought process. Uh, that I thought they asked important questions and went about answering them in a rigorous way. And guess what? <laughs> I, have, I have more good faith debates that are started on social media because I see those people's arguments and they make me think again. Um, mm -hmm. And I know there, there are people who I want to listen to, even if I, I don't happen to like or share their view on the issue that they're, they're, they're weighing in on. And I, I think that's a decent starting point for an individual. I think, uh, I think that so many of the, the – I actually don't have many debates on social media because I, I don't think they have the, the bandwidth for, right. you know, for complex conversation. But when I have done it, I've said before we're even going to talk about – the, you know, the substance of the issue. Let's agree on our standards of evidence. And I would walk through, here is, you know, here is what I consider a valid randomized controlled trial. Here is how I would gauge, uh, you know, a high quality longitudinal study. Mm -hmm. And then once we've agreed on the evidence, it's a lot easier to avoid the misinformation problem because they've already opted in to say, well, I can't bring you this kind of evidence because it's low quality. Um, and I know we can't do that with every topic, but I think it speaks to the broader point of, of setting your terms and standards before you get into the content. Well, Adam, it's been just terrific talking with you. I, I'm, I'm just curious. We would someday love to get you into a debate on our stage. The question is, what would you want to debate where you think there's actually a strong pushback on the other side? Uh, I'd love to have a debate about remote work because there are a lot of people who think it's a bad idea. And 
I think the best evidence we have available is suggesting that at least doing it a couple days a week is a net positive uh, for the performance and well-being outcomes that organizations and individuals care about. Oh, well, we will try to get you on our stage. We will be in touch. Adam Grant, thank you so much. Your book is called Think Again, and it has been a pleasure hearing you talk about debate, our culture, misinformation, and being able to change our minds. Adam Grant, thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you don't rethink that. (laughs) I want to thank you, our audience, for tuning into this episode of Intelligence Squared. I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. Intelligence Squared is a nonprofit that is generously funded by listeners like you, members of Intelligence Squared, academic institutions, and other partners, and by the Rosencrantz Foundation. Clea Connor is our CEO. David Ariosto is our head of editorial. Amy Kraft is our chief of staff and head of production. Shea Mara and Marlette Sandoval are our producers. Kim Strempel is our production coordinator. Damon Whittemore is our audio producer, and Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman. Our mission here at Intelligence Squared is to restore critical thinking and facts and reason and civility to American public discourse. We would love your support in that effort. Please visit www.intelligencesquaredus.org to join the debate and hear from both sides, at least both sides, of every issue. I'm John Donvan. Thanks so much for listening. 